All right, well, thank you uh, all for being here for Equipping Hour. It is uh, a joy to be with you this morning. Uh, Let me uh, open our time in prayer. God, we uh, come to you this morning uh, again in need of your grace, in need of your kindness, in need of your spirit to work in our hearts so that we could embrace in faith uh, your, your truth, your scripture, Lord. Uh, we think today on September 11th, a, a monumental day in the, the history of this nation, Lord, in the last uh, 20 years, 25 years, Lord. Um, we remember again our frailty, Lord. We remember again your protection over us. Uh, we remember again, Lord, with thankfulness, just the, the ability to, to worship together, to have freedom of religion, uh, to be able to gather uh, in, a, in a free country where we can open your word and we can encourage each other and we can meet uh, publicly, Lord. So we just thank you for these privileges that you've given to us. And we pray uh, today just for this nation, Lord. We pray for leaders and rulers. We pray for peace. Uh, we pray for protection, Lord. And we pray most of all that your gospel would continue to spread through the ends of the earth, Lord. Uh, that your glory would be made known here in Tempe uh, and through the ends of the earth. We pray for our missionaries in Papua New Guinea this morning, the Cairns. Um, pray that you would sustain them through hard circumstances, Lord, and trials, that you would be near to them, that you would be uh, their peace and their joy and their comfort. Pray all these things, Jesus, uh, in your mighty name. Amen. All right, well, welcome welcome again to Equipping Hour. It is great to be with you. I have an opportunity this morning to share some things that, that I've been working through. Uh, Smed gave me an opportunity this morning just to, just to share uh, just a, an area that I've, I've spent some time thinking through, studying, uh, as I've stepped into youth ministry, uh, I head up the youth ministry here in the, in the church, our junior high and high school ministry. So in that process over the last several months, I've spent a lot of time thinking through uh, what, what makes for a, a biblical ministry, whether it's youth ministry, whether it's other ministries in the church, why must the, the ministries in the church be, be centered on the Bible? What's a Bible-centered ministry? So asking the question, what, what are the things that we should go after in any ministry in the church, how, how should we go after them, and why? Why are we going after these things? So really, it's a, a philosophy of, of ministry, a, a biblical ministry in the church. So really just want to put, put in front of you some of the things that I've been studying, a framework for uh, biblical ministry in the church, whether it's, again, student ministries, adults, uh, Sunday morning, what, what are the things that we're going after? And I, uh, right now I'm in seminary, a seminary student, so in seminary you get to ask a lot of questions, you get to wrestle with a lot of different issues. So part of this is just me wrestling with different issues and asking these questions. Why do we, why do, we do the things that we do? Why do we do it this way? And we have Grace Bible Church, uh, our middle name is Bible, so why must all of our ministries be centered on the Bible? What are, what are we going after in that? So hopefully, as we work through this this morning, uh, the goal would be that, that you would affirm with me just the need, again, not that you're not convinced, but, but to be convinced again, the need for Scripture, for God's truth to be at the center uh, of our ministry, of our lives in the church. So we're going to look at some passages. We're going to work through a couple things together to just build a, a framework. Here's what ministry in the church looks like. So here's what a, a Bible-centered ministry looks like. So hopefully this connects some dots, maybe. Maybe it just again, fortifies the the importance of God's truth in your life, in your heart this week. So I'm asking some of these these why questions. Why do we do things this way? Why why do we need to go after truth this way? Why do we structure ministry in the way that we structure it? And I think it's helpful to to ask some of these why questions so that that we can actually uh, have motivation. So we, we understand, okay, this is what we're going after. So we embrace it. So we can say, yes, that's, that's what we should do. So we, we believe it together. Just to give you an example, my six-year-old, a couple weeks ago, we were about to eat dinner, I think it was, and said, hey, hey buddy, you need to wash your hands before dinner. And he said, you know, there, there's no dirt, no dirt on my hands. My hands are clean. <laughs> there's nothing on them. And, you know, and I know where six-year-olds have been playing. He's catching lizards in the yard. You know, just all of these things that, that six-year-olds do. I'm like, no, you, you need to wash your hands. Let, let me tell you about bacteria. Let me tell you about the things that you can't see. Just because you don't have mud on your hands doesn't mean they're not dirty. So we talked about why we would wash our hands. Uh, maybe scared them a little bit. You know, talked about some dangers of <laughs> having dirty hands when you eat. And, and after that conversation, 
he said, oh man, I got to wash my hands. <laughs> he runs and he, and he goes and washes his hands. And, and just that, that story, I think is helpful as I think about just kind of asking some of these questions, building this framework for, for him. You know, now he owns it. He says, oh yeah, I have to wash my hands. You know, not that every, every conversation with a six-year-old, there's definitely some things you don't, you don't have to explain to him. Just say, hey, you need to do this because daddy said. But in that case, it was helpful. He actually embraced the truth. He owned it for himself. So that's what we're going to do this morning is just, just ask some of these questions, look at some of these uh, aspects of ministry so that we would, together would own those things. We would say, yes, let's be more committed to these things. So we're going to look at, I think, uh, put the outline on the screen for you just of where we're going this morning. Uh, we'll, we'll work through these one at a time, but just want to give you the framework. So, so the title of this, Why a Biblical Ministry? And really, it's, again, building it. Here's a framework for, for ministry in the church surrounded by the truth. So really, it's, so I have the, the primacy of truth, the, the avenues for truth, and the goal of truth. Another way to say that is, is what are we going after? God's truth in the life of the church. How are we going after it? What are the avenues? What are the ways that it comes? And, and why are we going after it? What's the goal? And then after that, just want to spend a little time looking at maybe some practical applications. Here's some ways that that would intersect with our lives. So we'll, we'll jump in here, the, the role of truth, truth in the church, looking at, again, this framework. Why, why must the Bible be central to all of our ministries? Number one is the, the primacy of truth. The, the primacy of truth. You could say the preeminence of truth. Or what's God's plan for truth in the church? And when I say truth, I, I mean God's word that he's revealed to us, the, the Bible, Jesus says in John 17, 17, he says, sanctify them in truth. Your word is truth. Psalm 119, 160 says that the sum of your word is truth. All of it. Every word that God has spoken in this book is truth. So I'm, I'm using the word truth here. This is God's revealed word, the truth that he has given to us in scripture. And this, uh, the primacy of truth in the church, this, this hit home for me in a, in a seminary class. I was uh, sitting in class with David Britton, and he asked a question. Uh, David said, I think we were talking about as a New Testament survey class, and we were talking about what um, Paul, Paul's letters, all of Paul's letters. And I think David asked the question, what, what would you summarize the, Paul's letters? What is Paul going after? If you were going to put a summary statement over all of, all of Paul's New Testament epistles, and the, the pastor, Shane Kohler in Atlanta, he said, I, I would say that to summarize Paul's writing, I would say he's upholding truth. He is upholding truth for the church. He's, he's giving us God's truth. And, you know, I thought about that. It, it doesn't, maybe it doesn't seem that revolutionary, but it was a, kind of this light bulb moment. I had to think about, wait, is that accurate? Is that really what Paul's going after? And you think about, we'll actually go to, if you turn to 1 Timothy 3, 15, that's, it. That's exactly what Paul says the church is doing, is upholding God's truth in the world. That we're actually putting truth uh, at the center uh, of ministry. We're actually the, the ones that uphold truth in, in a dark world. So go to 1 Timothy 3.15. 1 Timothy 3.15. Paul says uh, in 1 Timothy 3.15, he's writing this to Timothy, who he's left in Ephesus, to strengthen the church in Ephesus. And he says, but in case I am delayed, I write so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and support of the truth. So Paul here tells us that the church, this is God's household, God's people. And what does the church do? The church upholds the truth, the, the pillar and support of the truth. You think about uh, Ancient Rome, ancient Greece, you, you could imagine the, the Parthenon, these different buildings, these huge pillars. Maybe in Washington, D.C., the, uh, the Lincoln, Lincoln Monument, these, these big pillars that are upholding these buildings. And you see those pillars, and they, and they, they uphold the building. They're foundational. They, they support the roof, but they also are decorative. They display their, their art. So think about the, the church here is the, the pillar and support of the truth. We are upholding God's truth. We're proclaiming it. We're holding it high and, and we're adorning God's truth. We're living it out. We're, we're, at, we're lives that have been so transformed by the truth of God that we, that we say, okay, that's someone that believes this truth. That truth is real because of the way that they live. 
So we speak it and we live it. That's what the church is doing. They're upholding God's truth in the world, proclaiming that truth. We're, We're declaring truth by the way that we live and, and with our words, our proclamation of truth. The, the church is the, the one entity in the world that has God's message. The only entity in the world that has God's message. That has God's message of rescue for sinners, the gospel. Here's how you can be reconciled to a holy God. The only message of salvation. We have that message. You think about all the, the confusion in the world, all the deception, all the lies, the darkness, the chaos. And we have truth. We have God's truth in a dark world. This is what makes the the church unique. We have God's message. So if truth is what makes the church the church, then truth must be central in the church. This is what our ministries must be about, is God's truth. Holding that high, proclaiming that. It is foundational. The primacy of truth in the church. It must be preeminent in the church. Turn to, to 2 Timothy 3.16, a couple pages over. 2 Timothy 3.16. I'm sure you know this, know this passage well. In 2 Timothy 3.16, you have this, this summary statement from Paul about the, the nature of Scripture, its authority, its sufficiency. Paul writes, All Scripture, Old and New Testament, all Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. So Paul gives this this summary statement, all of scripture. It's true. It's profitable. It's authoritative. It comes from God himself. And it has power. It has power in the lives of God's people. It's authoritative. It's sufficient. It's useful in the life of the Christian. So it comes from God, it teaches, it trains, it corrects. And Paul, who holds scripture this high, look what he he does in in chapter 4. Look where he goes. Chapter 4, verse 1 and 2. In light of this truth about scripture, Paul says, I solemnly charge you, and this is to Timothy, I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is the judge of the living and the dead, And by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. So he's saying with Jesus as a witness, in view of his future kingdom, what you must do with this truth is you must preach it. You must proclaim it. You must announce this truth. Verse three, he says, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, They will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires and will turn away their ears from the truth and will turn aside to myths. So Paul here is is giving Timothy at the end of Paul's life. This is, this is Paul's last letter, second Timothy. The apostles are are going off the scene here. Paul is not going to be around much longer. He's saying, Timothy, you have the scripture. What you must do after I'm gone is you must preach the word. You must proclaim this truth. Because there are going to be people that, that don't want sound doctrine. Verse 4, that are going to, they're going to turn their ears away from the truth. And that, that's the world we're in. A world that does not want to hear the truth. That wants teachers that are going to bring their own fulfillment. And what, and what Timothy must do and what every generation of, of pastor must do after him is preach the word. That's, that's going to be the, the lifeblood of the church. God's truth being proclaimed to God's people. So this must be the the diet of the church, proclamation of God's truth to the people of God. The 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 truth of God is preeminent in the church. Just one more one more passage I want you to think about Matthew Matthew twenty eight eighteen through twenty. You can turn there, or if if you have it memorized, you know this passage well. The the great commission, Jesus commissioned to his disciples. So you had here in in Second Timothy Paul's parting words to Timothy. Well, now you have what, what were Jesus parting words to his disciples. What does he want to impress on them before he leaves? And you know the passage, go therefore. Jesus, who has all authority, says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them and teaching them 
to obey all that I commanded you. Baptizing and teaching. So baptizing, this requires gospel proclamation. This requires evangelism. If people are going to profess Christ and be baptized into a gathering of other believers, they have to hear the truth and believe it. But then what are we to do with those new converts? Jesus says, teach them to obey all that I command you. Teach them everything that Jesus has commanded, all of his truth. Teach that to God's people. So, so that's where we must start. The, the church is about proclaiming God's message to the ends of the earth, going, proclaiming this message, declaring uh, good news towards sinners. And the, the ones that are saved, it's, it's the same thing. We are proclaiming God's truth to them. Discipling them, make disciples by, by teaching them to obey. So, so back to the, the question, why a Bible-centered ministry? Well, first, the, we see in Scripture this preeminence of truth. The, the preeminence of truth, the Bible must be central. We uphold the truth. The church preaches the truth. We go to all nations with this truth. So the, the Bible must be preeminent. God's truth must be preeminent in the church. Now as we transition, again, this, this framework for biblical ministry so you have the, the role of truth. First is the, the primacy of truth or the preeminence of truth. Second would be the avenues of truth. You could say, how does it come? So first would be what? And then we'd say, what? Well, we need, to, we need to proclaim truth. Well, how? What does this look like in the life of the church? What are the ways that the, the truth comes to us? What are the avenues? Again, all of it coming from this word, from this book, from what God has revealed. This is, this is the only thing that we have. This is all that we need. But how does it come? What are the, the avenues that it comes to us? So I want to look at actually six things here, six avenues in the life of the church that you see in the New Testament. First, uh, we've talked about this already, but first would be preaching, the, the role of preaching in the church. 2 Timothy 4.2, that was the passage we just looked at. Paul says, preach the word. 1 Timothy 4.13 Paul, again, writes to Timothy before, before 2 Timothy, this first instruction to Timothy. He says, until I come, this is 1 Timothy 4.13, until I come, give attention to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, and to teaching. So Paul, again, says, make this a priority. Pay attention to this. Go after this. Reading Scripture, exhorting, teaching. This is preaching. You, you read the text. You explain the text. And then you exhort with that text. You say, you must believe this. That's what's going on. When, when Smed's up here preaching, he's saying, this is what God has written. And this is why you must believe it. You actually have to bend your will to submit to this truth. Your thoughts must bend to what God has said here. So this is, this is a primary way that truth comes to us. This must be a staple in the church. But, but we know that pastors and teachers... The, the pastors of the church, they're, they're more than just preachers. Preach, preaching is a, you could say, is a subset of, of shepherding, of pastoring. It's one avenue of pastoring. We're going to see, I want you to look at Ephesians 4.11 to see the, the role. What are, what are the shepherds of the church? What are the pastors of the church going after in the church? Go to Ephesians 4.11. This, this passage is so helpful as it informs the ministry of the church what the church should be going after, how they should go after it. So Ephesians 4.11, in this section, Paul is saying that Jesus has given gifts to his church. The, the conquering King Jesus gives gifts to his church. And these gifts that he has given, verse 11, it says, he gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers. So you have the, the apostles and prophets, the foundation layer of the church. They, they were giving New Testament revelation. They were writing scripture. Well, those, those gifts to the church, those, those no longer exist. We have their, their ministry. We have the scripture with us. We don't still have apostles and prophets. But what we do have as, as the gospel has gone out, as, as churches have been established and planted, we have still with us this gift of pastors, teachers. And in the original, you could translate this as, as one, one individual person, a pastor, teacher. 
Not necessarily two different. You have a pastor over here and a teacher over here, but a pastor teacher, a pastor who is teaching, a shepherd. The word for, for pastor means shepherd. This is what, what Smed's been preaching on uh, the last several weeks, that, that Jesus is the good shepherd and he has under shepherds. He has placed in his church under shepherds, pastors, to, to feed the people of God. Think about Peter. After Jesus comes to Peter, after Jesus' uh, resurrection, he says to Peter, feed my sheep, feed my lambs. This is what the, the pastors of a church do. They feed the people of God. And what do they feed them with? With the truth. Feed God's people with God's truth. Look at, look at what it says, verse 11. These are the, the gifts, the, the pastors and teachers into verse 11. And what are they for? Verse 12, for the equipping of the saints for the work of service, to the building up of the body of Christ. So these pastor teachers are equipping the saints. They are bringing truth. They are feeding the, the congregation, the sheep, the blood-bought sheep in a church are being fed God's truth from the pastor teachers. That's, that's a way, that's an avenue that truth comes to us. The, the shepherds bringing us truth. This, this gift to the church to nourish our souls with truth. And this happens obviously in the pulpit, but this happens one-on-one. -on -one. This happens in one-on-one in -on -one relationships. This happens in small groups. Think about the, the elders of this church. You have some that are preaching on a Sunday. You have others that are, are counseling one-on-one, -on -one, others that are leading small groups that are teaching in Saturday morning build, the men's Bible study. So the, the pastors of the church are feeding the congregation, both one-on-500 up here, one-on-one, one-on-three, smaller groups. That's what they're doing. They're equipping with truth. They're feeding God's people with truth. So this is where it begins. Truth coming to God's people from the, the leaders of the, of the church who are studying, who are demonstrating godliness, equipping the saints. But we're going to stay in Ephesians 4. Let's look at another way, another way that truth comes to us in the church. Second here would be one another. One another. And stay in Ephesians 4. So you have the, the pastors, Ephesians 4, 11 and 12, equipping the saints, feeding them truth, pouring into them. I, I listened to this, uh, this podcast that um, John Piper was, was speaking on, in a, and he was introduced by a, a man that he discipled. And, and the man that he discipled said of John Piper, he said, what, what John Piper did is he taught me what it looks like to, to be a pastor. Because... Every time I was with him, he was always teaching. In a staff meeting, he's teaching. In an elder meeting, he's teaching. In counseling, he's teaching. He's teaching, teaching, teaching. He's always teaching God's truth. And then you see the, the effect. What's the effect of that in a congregation? And you, and you read on in verse 13 through 16. Verse 13, it says, Until we all attain the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. So the pastors are equipping the saints toward maturity. Verse 14, as a result, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is head, even Christ. So what's going on here is you have these, these people being fed God's truth, and now they're able to, to encourage one another with truth. Verse 15, but speaking the truth in love, we grow up, together we grow up into maturity. So you have it coming from, from pastors to the congregation. Now the congregation has the truth. They're together encouraging each other. They're speaking truth to one another. So that's how truth comes in the church. As you think about the, the primacy of truth in the church, how does it come to us? What well, comes through, through one another. We have the truth. We speak it to one another. In love, we speak truth to each other. We aren't, we aren't sanctified just by the mere fact of, of gathering. Being in the same room with another Christian doesn't make us more like Christ. Just by the fact of, of sitting at the same table. We, we encourage each other with truth. And that's what makes us mature. That's what it's saying in verse 15. We speak the truth in love and we grow together as we encourage one another with truth, with God's truth, with his word. That's, that's how we grow together. That's how we become more mature. 
And that's not just in the, the formal gatherings of the church. It's not just on Sunday morning. It's not just when we have calendar events. You can think of two ladies doing a play date with kids, speaking the truth in love to one another, encouraging each other. And the church is more than just, it's not a building. The church is the, the people of God, the blood-bought people of God who gather together. So we do this with each other. We encourage each other. We speak truth to each other. So that's how another way that truth comes in the church, one another. That's what it says, verse 16 of Ephesians 4. It says, from whom, that is Jesus, the whole body, being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. So now the church is building itself up. The body, the church body, by speaking truth to one another, is building itself up in love, growing in maturity together. So this is how truth comes to us. First, in, in preaching and teaching, pastors, and then one another. And then thirdly, maybe this, this would be a, a subset, you could say, of one another's. But the thing about discipleship relationships. Discipleship. This would be a function of one another's. But, but you have different patterns in the New Testament of, of intentional relationships. Titus 2, you have, you have older women teaching younger women how to, how to love their husbands and children, how to be workers in the home. You have a, a pattern in the New Testament. Come alongside those that are, that are less mature in the faith and help them. Walk, walk hand in hand with them. As you speak truth and love, get to know them. Build relationships. Model truth for them so that they can become more mature. You see this in Titus 2 as older women teaching younger women. In, in Titus 2, you have implicitly... You have older men and younger men in that passage. This pattern of, of discipleship. Paul says in 2 Timothy 2.2, he gives this instruction to Timothy to, to instruct faithful men with the truth so that they could raise up another generation of, of leaders in the church. To find faithful men, to pour into their lives, and to teach them truth. To disciple them, to come alongside of them. Obviously, uh, husbands and wives would fit into this category. Somewhere between discipleship, one another's, you know, this most important relationship, if you're married, where, where the most truth should be spoken in a marriage. Where we're speaking the truth, hopefully in love, all the time to each other, helping each other grow in the truth. So, so to summarize here, you have, you have pulpit ministry, you have authoritative proclamation of the truth. You have the, the whole church sitting together, being accountable to these same truths. Private instruction, discipleship relationships, one-on-one, -on -one, smaller gatherings. You have people modeling truth for others. Older women coming alongside younger women. And just think about how helpful that is when, when you see, if, you, if you've experienced just watching someone else parent. I know as a young parent, for me, that's been so helpful. To be able to watch other people. Oh, that's how they talk to their kids. Oh, that's how they work through issues. Oh, that's how, they, that's how he talks about his wife. That's how, that's how he, he thinks about just his own Bible reading. It is so instructive to watch other people live out the Christian life. So that's the pattern. You have just these multifaceted ways that truth comes to us, these avenues that truth comes in the church. So let's keep going a couple more. Where does truth come to us in the church? Hopefully this is on your list, high on your list. Uh, next would be personal Bible reading and meditation. It seems, it seems obvious, but it still needs to be said that, that we have the scripture in our own language. This is unique. This is a unique phenomenon in our age of the church. If you consider for, for church history, how many generations of Christians, they didn't have access to their own copy of the scriptures. You know, they're meditating on truth. They're speaking truth to each other, but they can't, they can't go and, and study the truth on their own. We have the Bible in our language, on our shelves, on our phones, even uh, easy access to God's word to, to meditate on, not, not just to do a, a quiet time. Yes, do a quiet time, but meditate on these truths. Let the word of Christ dwell richly in you. So this is the, the way that truth comes in the church. We read our Bibles. We meditate on scripture. We recall these truths to mind. You know, there's a, a lot that could be said here. I know this is a, a focus, a build and wellspring. Our, our men and women's discipleship ministry started this week, and that's, that's a focus in those ministries, is you bringing your own heart to God's word. 
your personal Bible reading, meditation on scripture, your prayer life. There's a lot of passages you can consider. I just put a couple up here. I think Psalm 1 is, is so helpful that the, the blessed one, the happy one, is the one who meditates on the law of the Lord, who finds delight in God's law. That's, that's what they do in the morning. When they wake up and when they lie down, they're, they're bringing God's truth to bear. They meditate on God's truth. Next, another way that truth comes would be singing together, singing together. And maybe this is a, a function of, of one another's. I just think it's helpful to remind us, even our corporate gathering, turn to Colossians 3. Colossians 3.16, Paul writes, Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you, with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another, with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. So you have the believers in the church being saturated with truth, teaching each other truth, and specifically here, teaching each other through singing, through psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. So when we, when we gather in 45 minutes from now, when we stand to sing together, we are singing truth to each other. We're, we're praising the Lord with thankfulness and we're instructing each other in the truth. We're, we're affirming the same truth to each other. We believe these truths. We're instructing one another in the truth. This is another way that, that truth comes to us in, in the, the life of the church. Another avenue that it comes. Finally, one last, one last avenue on here. Last way that truth comes in the church. And you, you, could, you could probably slice these differently, categorize them differently, just trying to give you a scope of, again, as we're thinking about what's a framework for ministry in the church, a biblical framework for ministry. Again, I'm starting from this, just youth ministry. How do we think about ministry? Why must the Bible be central to our ministry in the church? Looking at, okay, what's God say about the about truth in the church. Okay, how does it come to us? What are the ways that truth comes? And this, this last one, I think we can't miss in the life of the church, parents to children. Both Old and New Testament, this pattern for God's people to instruct their children in the truth, to train them. Deuteronomy 6, God says, Hear, O Israel, you must listen and obey and love me. And you must teach these things, these truths to your children, to your sons and your daughters. You must talk about them when you rise up and when you lie down, all, all of your life, everything that you're doing, when you're in the car, when you're driving, when you're eating breakfast, instructing your children in the truth, training them. This is, this is how truth comes in the life of the church, parents to children. Ephesians 6.4 says, Ephesians 6.4, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. You could say, train them in the truth, to instruct them, to teach them truth. So as you think about any ministry in the church, again, youth ministry, children's ministry, whatever ministry, we are, we are training in the truth. NGM, four-year-old, Sunday school class, what are we doing? We're instructing in the truth. We're telling them the good news of Jesus, of rescue, we're telling them what God says about sin and righteousness, about how they can be saved. We're instructing in the truth. So we're pouring truth, whether it's students, adults, we're pouring truth to God's people, instructing them in the truth. Here, parents to children. And I think having this, this framework for how truth comes to us is, is so helpful to, in one sense, to simplify. What are we going after in the church? Well, we're, we're trying to declare God's truth to one another. We're trying to sit under the preaching of the truth. We want to hear the truth. We want to live the truth. And we want to speak it to each other. That's what we're going after in the church. In one sense, that's, that's pretty simple. There's not a certain, a certain method. Right? It's, it's truth, God's truth, opening up this book and declaring it to God's people. Declaring it to one another. Declaring it to, to a lost and dying world. So we see here God, God's priority. First, God's priority for truth is the first, first point. Second, the, the avenues for truth. So you could say the what 
the how, how does it come, the avenues. And now thirdly, the, the why. You know, why, why must we wash our hands? Why do we have to do this? What's the reason? Again, so that you would own it, so that we together would own it. This is why it's so critical. This is why it's so important. This is why we're going after this. This is why truth must be central in the church. Turn to Colossians 1.28. Colossians 1.28. This, uh, this verse is just a succinct, helpful purpose for any ministry in the church. This is what we're going after. This is the goal. Colossians 1.28. We proclaim him, admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom so that we may present every man complete in Christ. So you see, again, the same pattern, admonishing, teaching every single person in the church, every man. This is uh, Paul, again, instructing the pastor. Admonish and teach every man in the church, every man, woman, child, everyone in the church. And you have the purpose here. What's the purpose? Why must we do that? Verse 28, second half, so that, this is the reason, so that we may present every man complete in Christ. Christian maturity. We, we were going after Christ likeness so that God's people would look more like their Savior. That's, that's the goal. Instruct and admonish with truth so that God's people would look more like Jesus. They would become more Christ like. So, all of these avenues, all of these ways, they're going after exalting Christ in the lives of God's people. So, any ministry in the church. Your conversations with each other when you're together. That's what you're going after. That's what your goal should be. I want them to grow in Christ likeness. Well, how are they going to go in Christ, grow in Christ likeness? Well, they have to have the truth. I have to speak the truth to them. They have to have God's word. That's what he's going to use to grow them. So that, that informs our, our conversations. That informs our ministries. That informs what are we doing when we gather together. We are going after Christ likeness. We're going after maturity. Turn to, to John 17, 17, just so you can put your eyes on it. I referred to it earlier, but John 17, 17, as Jesus prays to his father, this, this high priestly pr prayer before his crucifixion, he prays for his disciples and for, for all of the disciples after them. This is his prayer, John 17, 17. He prays to his father. He says, sanctify them, that is his disciples, sanctify them in truth. Your word is truth. So this is what the truth does in God's people. It sanctifies. It makes them holy. It makes them, again, more like Christ. To, to set them apart, to be, a, to be a holy people. This is what God's truth accomplishes, to, to make you holy, make you more like Christ. So using God's truth to, to bend your will, bend your life, to bend your thinking, your actions, your priorities, your desires, so that all of those would become more like Jesus, that they would align with what, what he thinks we should prioritize, what he says we should desire, what he says we should think. That's what we're doing. We're aligning our thoughts, our affections with what Jesus says. So that's the, the goal of truth, sanctification, the, the holiness of God's people. We turn back to one more time to 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy 1.5. Just Paul, Paul phrases this a, a little bit of a different way that I think is really helpful for us. The, the goal of truth here. Omri's uh, walked through 1 Timothy with our, our young adults group, 414. So they, they all should have this verse tattooed in their memory. He's gone back to it over and over again because it's so instructive for us. 1 Timothy 1.5. Paul says to Timothy, but the goal of our instruction is love. Love from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. So Paul here says this, this book of instruction, this book, 1 Timothy, I'm writing to you so you would know how to behave in God's house. Here's all these truths you must know. 
But what's his goal? What's his aim? Here's what I'm going after. I want this truth to accomplish in you. He says, the goal is love. That's that's what the truth should accomplish is love. And a certain kind of love. He qualifies this love, uh, a pure hearted love, love from a, a good conscience, a sincere faith. This would be a pure devotion to Christ. That's what the truth is accomplishing, internal purity, purity of heart. And another way to think about sanctification, it's producing holiness in the inner man, purified desires. So this is such a helpful reminder as we think about truth. Not, not just that we would be theologically sound, just so that we could be smart, so we could be eggheads, have, have the right answers. But the, the goal is that we would have pure motives that we would have a clean conscience, that we would have a pure devotion to Christ. So that's the motivation for us as you think about truth, intaking truth, all of these avenues in the church that truth comes to us, the, the ministries of the church. Why do we do these things? Well, to, to grow our love, to grow our devotion to Jesus so we become more like Christ. And that's motivation for us as you think about sitting under preaching, being involved in, in the different ministries of the church, be involved in, in small groups and build Wellspring, being involved in each other's lives, being connected to other believers. All of, these, all of these things, all of these avenues, when truth is present, they're going to produce love, uh, love from a, from a pure heart, a, a pure devotion to Christ. And this is not, not to think of it as a, we just, as long as we put in these inputs, this is what will come out. Obviously, Paul here is going after a, a sincere faith. This is, this is an act of faith. This is entrusting, this, entrusting yourself to what God says on his terms. Not just, okay, if I, if I read this much, if I have this much truth, then I'll have this. Well, no, it's, it's a certain pursuit, kind of pursuit of truth. A, a faith-filled pursuit of truth. Uh, embracing in faith what God says. That, that will grow our love. That will purify our inner man. So this, uh, this study for me has been so helpful as we think about, again, just building this framework, just working through, okay, why, what are we going after in, in ministry? Again, for me, looking at, okay, a youth ministry, one aspect, but what are we going after? We're going after imparting truth, to summarize, imparting truth in all of these different avenues, teaching through relationships, one-on-one discipleship, speaking truth directly into people's lives, getting to know them so you know their, their weaknesses, their sin, their struggles, so you can speak truth to them specifically, broadly speaking truth, so that, so that God's people would become more mature, that they would grow in love, that we would, we would have a pure devotion to Christ. That, that's what we're going after. That's what, that's what any ministry in the church is going after. And with a, a couple minutes remaining, I just want to just look at a couple of ways this works out just to, to make it a little more practical for you. The, the outworking of truth in the believer. Outworking of truth in the believer. I think the, the first hand building the framework is helpful to say this, this is what this looks like. Uh, kind of like a, you know, a science textbook. Let's, lo- let's look at this. Let's look at these things. And now let's actually do an experiment. We have the, the framework, we have the methodology. Now let's look, how does this work? How does truth intersect in the life of the believer to produce growth? So think about renewing your mind, Romans 12. We Romans 12 too. Paul says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. I remember Smed preached through, through this section a couple years ago. It was so helpful as he's talked about not being squeezed. I think he made up a word, squozen, something like that, into the, the pattern of the world, to not be squeezed, the world around us. Think about the, the world system, ideologies, philosophy, to not be squeezed into the thinking of the world, all these things that come after us, all these temptations that, that come into our mind, wrong thinking, lies, and deception. Don't be squeezed into those things. Well, how do we not be conformed to the thinking, the mindset of the world? How do we not be worldly? 
but we have to renew our mind. This is how we fight this pressure from the world. Mind renewal. You renew your mind with truth. God's truth. You have to know what God says. You have to know what his will is. It says here, then you will, then you will demonstrate, you will prove what the will of God is. Well, how would you know what the will of God is? You have to, you have to read your Bible. You have to, to hear truth. You have to know what it is. So just mind renewal, the, the Christian life, just Christi- Christianity 101, renewing your mind with truth, fighting temptation. You have to know God's truth. My favorite, I think, definition of obedience is uh, one author. He says, uh, obedience is the, the bending of your will to God's will. Bending of your will to God's will. So you have to, you have to say, I know what God's will for my life is, sanctification, my holiness, I know what his will is because I've read this book. I know what God desires. I know what he says. Now I have to bend my fleshly thoughts, my, my selfishness, all of my fleshly desires. I have to bend those things to what God says. I have to align myself with, with God's thinking. And you can't obey more than you know. You can't obey more than you, you know. You have to know what God says in order to obey. So we have to be saturated in the truth to, to renew our mind against all the, the lies of the world. You look at all these, again, all these avenues for truth in the church. We need to partake of all those things. We need to be saturated in the truth, reading our Bibles, speaking truth to each other, hearing the preaching of the word, being around God's people. So when we open our Bible, we're reminding ourselves God's thoughts, what God thinks, what he says, who he is. With our remaining time, I just want to look one more place. Uh, Proverbs 2. Solomon lays this out really helpfully for us. In Proverbs 2. Again, just looking at uh, here another, let's say, a case study. How does this work? You think about the priority of truth in the church here. Okay, what does it look like in the life of the Christian? To, to have truth, to use truth, to renew your mind with truth. Proverbs 2, the, the first five verses. Read with me Proverbs 2. We'll look at verses 1 through 4. You have, you'll see these three if statements. If you do this, if you do this, if you do this. So Solomon writes to his son, Proverbs 2, 1. My son, if you will receive my words and treasure my commandments within you, make your ear attentive to wisdom, incline your heart to understanding. For if you cry for discernment, lift your voice for understanding. And if you seek her as silver and search for her as hidden treasure... So you have these, these if statements, if you go after God's wisdom, if you pursue God's truth, if you make it your ambition to, to know what God says, to be saturated in the truth, if you go after those things, he says it three different ways. If this is the, the pattern of your life, you humbly go after, I want to know what God says. I want to know his wisdom. Verse five, then this is what will happen. Then you will discern the fear of the Lord. And discover the knowledge of God. So you're eagerly, eagerly searching for God's truth. Putting yourself in, in places to hear God's truth. Meditating on God's truth. Then it says you will know the fear of the Lord. You will fear God. So pursuing God's word leads to, to fear of God. This holy reverence for God. An awe of who God is. It'd be at the, at the same time a, a desire to, to please him and, and a fear of offending him. This fear of the Lord, to, to see God as the creator, as the king, as the judge. To recognize that he is the one who will, will put an end to all sin and unrighteousness, that he will judge the world. To fear him, to submit to what he says. That comes through intake of truth, receiving God's word. That's what he says in the first four verses. If you go after truth, if you go after God's wisdom, then you will fear the Lord. That's where you must start. So as you open your Bible, as you hear God's word preached, as you sit in a small group with one another, 
when you hear God's truth, you are filling your mind with, with thoughts about God, about who he is, about what he says, about his character, about his purposes. This is God's book. So we read this book and we learn about God. We learn about our creator, our king. And that grows our fear of him. We see him rightly. We can't fear him if we don't know anything about him, if we don't know who he is. If we have wrong thoughts about him, that's not going to grow our fear. We have to have right thoughts about him to grow our fear so that we would see God rightly. And Solomon goes on in this passage to say that this fear of the Lord will protect you from sin. It will guard you. Verse 11, discretion will guard you. Understanding will watch over you. Verse 12, to deliver you from the way of evil. That you you read God's word, you intake truth, you grow in fear of the Lord, and then you actually have the ability to to fight temptation and sin. Because you know God, you know what he says. You care about what he thinks. You've been saturated, saturated in these truths about God. Just think about any any sin in your life. Any sin ultimately has its root in in a distrust of God's character and a distrust of his word. All sin could root it back to, I distrust something about God and I'm not believing something that that has been revealed about God. So that's why we have to know God's truth. Think about complaining. When you complain about, about circumstances, you're discontent about something. You're saying that something didn't happen the way that I wanted it to. This person didn't do what I wanted. This situation didn't work out the way I wanted. Now I'm discontent. I grumble. Maybe just in your heart, internally you grumble. You're saying, God, what you have for me today is not good. You're saying, God, your plans for me are not good. Your control over the universe, at least in this moment, is not good. That's what your heart is saying. You're saying, I would be a better king than you would be, at least in this situation. And think about what you're saying about God's word. You're rejecting his promises. You obviously have clear commands he's given. Don't complain, don't grumble. So you have to run past those commands. You have to run past clear commands to be thankful always. But, but you're also distrusting what God says about his goodness. And God says that he'll work all things for the good of those who love him. In that moment when you complain, you distrust that promise. You don't believe it. So how would you fight this root of distrust in God and his word? Well, you have to know God's word. You have to know what he says. You have to recognize these lies in your heart. You fight those with truth. You bring truth to bear in your heart through his word, through his, through his truth, through his Bible. I had a couple more, a couple more on here. I actually want to go, go to the, the fifth one here. I'll just... Just something I've been, been encouraged by. Number five, you just flip ahead a couple slides. Ephesians chapter one. Just another way, just a practical way that, that truth works, works itself out in the lives of a believer. Ephesians 1.13. Paul, Paul's writing to this church in Ephesus, the Ephesian Christians. And he's reminding them of, of their, their rescue, that they're, they're part of God's great salvation promises because they believe the gospel. In verse 13, this is what he says about, about the gospel. In him, that is in Jesus, you, Ephesians, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, also, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise. So he says, you listen to this message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. So in conversion, they they heard God's truth, this gospel, this message of rescue. Here is a message of rescue to sinners, a message of truth in contrast to all the lies in this pagan culture that the Ephesians are in, all all these pagan lies, every lie that you could think of, of how a sinner could be reconciled to God. Think about all the ways that the world would tell you that you could be rescued. How could you have salvation? How many lies have you heard? You know, God is, is, not, is not good. Maybe a good God wouldn't send people to hell. That's a lie that the world would say. You know, you're not that bad. You're pretty good. That's a lie. That's opposite of what God says. You know, all ways lead to heaven. 
lie, all these lies that the world would tell us, the gospel, this message of, of salvation, of rescue, it's called the message of truth. It smashes all of these lies, comes to, to unbelievers, and smashes all the lies that the world would tell them about how you could be saved. Here's the truth. There is one message. There is one savior. You are, you are not good. God will judge and he has provided a way out. That's what, that's what the truth does. It smashes the lies of the world, brings clarity through God's spirit so that, that sinners could embrace the truth and believe. So as we think about just, just ministry again, back to the, back to why, why a, a Bible centered ministry? Why must the Bible be central in the church? Well, well this is why we think about the, the, the reasons here that, that we have been given to, to bring maturity to God's people so we become more Christ-like. And then, and then we see how truth works, smashes the lies of the world, helps us build a, a fear of God to fight sin, grows our love for Christ. So I hope that this is helpful just, to, just again to fortify us, not, not with anything that you don't know already, not with anything that you don't believe already, but just to, to fortify us so that we would again embrace God's truth this week to say, yes, I, I want to be saturated in the Bible. I want to speak truth to, to one another. I want to hear God's truth. I want to be surrounded by God's truth so that I can become more mature in Christ and lead others to maturity in Christ. So would you, would you pray with me as we close? God, thank you again for your word, your powerful word, your word that brings uh, life and light, brings conviction, Lord, that, uh, that brings salvation through your spirit. I pray that we would, in humble faith, embrace your truth, that we would love your truth, Lord, because we love you, because we want to grow in, in devotion to you, so that we would be saturated as a church, saturated with your Bible, your truth, so that we could grow in love for you and grow in love for each other. And that we could be a, a d demonstration to a watching world of, of what lives look like that have, that have trusted Christ and have been transformed. We pray that in all these things, Jesus, you would be magnified. Amen.